Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the blessing of this Lord's Day that You have given us, this day set aside for our worship of You and our rest in You. We thank You that by Your Holy Spirit we are enabled to worship You in spirit and in truth. And so we pray today as we continue our study of prayer that this will be a precursor to our assembled worship across the street, uh, that this will be a time in which we are encouraged and edified and grow in our knowledge of You and of prayer. We pray that you would guide us, that you would direct us, and that above all, that you would be glorified through our continued study. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've uh, we finally made it. Uh, you knew it was coming, and uh, I've been telling you it was coming, and uh, we are here. And that is, we have arrived officially at the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I know that uh, all of you are familiar with the Lord's Prayer as we pray it in every one of our worship services. Uh, I would imagine that uh, if not all, at least most of you have the Lord's Prayer memorized. And so you are going to be very familiar with our walk through it, at least as you have it memorized. Uh, what may surprise you, however, is that we may look at it in greater depth than you've ever looked at it before. Uh, we may look at it on themes and points derived by the Westminster Divines uh, that may be new to you, uh, may be encouraging to you. And uh, so we'll work our way through this. I'm going to uh, try to go at, at two questions and answers at a time, which should finish us with that last Sunday in December. And today we are looking at question 189 and 190. Um, I will say though, to chase a rabbit, um, last Sunday I think it was, was J.D. or Jerry who had asked the question about public prayer, and you had asked, it was you wasn't it, that had asked if, um, if, if the Westminster Divines cover public prayer uh, per se, or specifically in uh, the larger catechism, and I said that they don't. However, I had referenced uh, the Westminster Directory of Worship. And uh, this is a handy little copy uh, that's produced by Christian Heritage, which is a Scottish publisher uh, that um, is readily available here in the States. And this version actually has an introduction by uh, Presbyterian Sinclair Ferguson and uh, Baptist Mark Dever. Uh, and the, uh, the introductions are both helpful just in themselves, but then in looking through the Director of Worship, I think that you'll also find some tie-ins with the Westminster Standards. Um, one of the, the points being, to answer your question, they do address public prayer in the Director of Worship, uh, however, only pertaining to before and after the sermon. Um, and so preparation for the preaching of the Word and hearing of the Word, and then pr uh, prayer for the application of the Word. Uh, but still, both sections within the directory are helpful, and this is an easy, fairly inexpensive copy if you want to pick up a copy at uh, Amazon or someplace like that. All right, so question 189. The question is, what doth the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? Answer. The preface of the Lord's Prayer, contained in these words, Our Father, which art in heaven, teacheth us, when we pray, to draw near to God with confidence of His fatherly goodness and our interest therein, with reverence and all other childlike dispositions, heavenly affections, and due apprehensions of His sovereign power, majesty, and gracious condescension, as also to pray with and for others. Little did you know there was that much there in that little phrase. Well, you're used to it by now, right? We've gone through uh, this larger catechism and found uh, the depth and the richness of so many of these things that we may have perhaps taken for granted. But I want to start with this topic that's conveyed uh, in this first part of, the, of this preface. If we were to boil down two themes, to summarize into two themes, what would you say are the two themes of this preface? What are the two themes of this preface? Well, one is, most obviously, is that God 
is the father of his children. God is the father of his children. If you look at it, our, our Father which art in heaven, or as we pray, our Father who art in heaven, uh, fairly uh, easily, we fairly easily deduce that we're praying to our Heavenly Father and we are praying as His children. That would be implied, right? But the second theme that I want to draw to your attention that, that is uh, a summary of everything else in this answer uh, is that God and His children are not equals. God is God. We are His children. He is the Creator. We are created. We pray to Him. He does not pray to us. Uh, this is not a uh, relationship of equals. And so... Uh, there is, as they use this language here, uh, that we are to pray in all other childlike dispositions. That's just a beautiful little turn of phrase uh, that places us right where we are as children of our Heavenly Father. And then I love this expression toward the end of this answer that we're not only uh, praying uh, for His sovereign majesty, or to, in terms of defining Him as His sovereign power, majesty, but also His gracious condescension. Uh, there is a condescension to us. Uh, as I have said to you before, and will continue to say to you uh, again, that one of the greatest gifts that we have as God's people is that our God is one who has chosen to reveal Himself. Uh, he is not the unknown God. Uh, rather, He is the known God who has revealed Himself to us in His written Word and in the Incarnation, in the person of Jesus Christ. But that brings up a question when we use the term of Father, could we say that God is the Father of everyone? God is the Father of everyone, and therefore every person, every human being is a child of God. Some of you have said no, loudly. Why, why, would, why would you say... That, and let me, let me also say this, there are actually uh, some verses in the Bible, I did not put it in your handout, I should have, um, where uh, all human beings are referred to as the children of God. Uh, why, then would you, why, why then would you say that, that not everyone is a child of God? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And, and confronting the sins of the Pharisees, uh, Jesus uh, says to them, and, and, and when they're accusing Him of being born in iniquity, He says, well, you're of your father, the devil. Right? So we see a distinction there. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, and that's that's probably uh, that's probably a, a better refined expression of referring uh, to the children of God as the uh, elect. But in the simplicity of this prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray, we're simply praying as His children to our Father in heaven. And so we may think of it just simply in this distinction: is that if someone says to me. Uh, am I a child of God? I'm going to take them, as Francis Schaeffer uh, encouraged us to do, all the way back to creation. And I'm going to make sure that, first of all, that they know the distinction between a... Whoop, I don't mean that. Uh, I mean... Where's my thing to erase? Eraser. Thank you. A creation or creature, as we might say, and a child. To make that distinction, we need to first of all understand that all human beings have been 
created in the image of God. We are a creation or a creature, but not everyone has been redeemed. We are a child of God by virtue of God's saving grace through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and therefore adopted into His family. That's right. That's right. Yeah, He is indeed the Father of all creation. Incidentally, that's what the verse I was alluding to that I'm seeing now I didn't put in your handout. Uh, that's the reference. In, in that sense, if we were to use a child as a, in, in the sense of a creation, then yes, God, God's the Father of all creation. But in the narrow sense that we see it used within the New Testament, uh, clearly there is a distinction between one uh, who is the child of the devil as uh, Josie quoted, and one who is a child of God. Uh, the Apostle John uses this terminology uh, quite frequently in his epistles. Uh, for example, in 1 John uh, chapter 3, the Apostle writes, By this it is evident who are the children of God. That just introduction right there ought to clue us in, right? Distinction, distinction, distinction. But he goes on to say, and who are the children of the devil. Noting that distinction again that Jesus makes in his confrontation with the Pharisees. John goes on to say, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And you may recall that's the section in 1 John where he elaborates on love within the church and what that testifies. And later he goes on to say, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed or truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. And again, he's elaborating on what shows and what reflects a, a child of God. And it is, as John is typical of doing, of showing forth those fruits, the fruits that show that we are, in fact, uh, the regenerate children of God. Only those who have by God's grace and believe savingly on the Lord Jesus Christ may then call the Lord, the, our God, Father. Which brings up the question, what about the Old Testament saints? Yes. Yeah, Galatians, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the implication of a relational, uh, uh, the relationship between God and His child. That's right. That's right. Could the Old Testament saints say that? Yes, they could. Why, why could Old Testament believers refer to Yahweh as their Heavenly Father? That's right. And, well, no doubt. Flesh that out, is what I'm saying. Flesh that out for us. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's the point I'm, I'm trying to, to, to get at is, and this has come up in some dialogue uh, that I've had with some as to the, the, the use and placement of the Lord's Prayer and so forth and so on. And, and, and the point that I'm, I'm trying to drive home is this is not just a New Testament concept. Um, this is not something that, that we get to the New Testament and go, oh, okay, so there's this child distinction. No, just as the Old Testament saints look forward to the promise of the Messiah fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So also, we as New Testament believers look back to the finished work of Christ on the cross and His resurrection. Yes? True, true. We definitely see that in, in, in reference to Israel uh, and God's chosen people being referred to as, in fact, the Son. In fact, the, the whole idea of a people being referenced into uh, one name that is the name of one person, uh, even in that sense of the sonship, uh, is all tied into what we see fully revealed in the New Testament. And that's, a, that's a great uh, uh, tie-in, uh, Josh. Um, how should then we approach our Heavenly Father? 
How should we approach our Heavenly Father? Remember, what's the preface? Our Father who art in heaven. That's the section we're on right now. What should this teach us about how we are to approach our Heavenly Father? Right? With reverence? What else? Yeah, I'm, I'm drawing from the answer to question 189, am I not? Uh, first of all, it, it teaches us uh, to approach Him in reverence um, as His children. We might add that, uh, reverence as children. So also, we are to approach Him with confidence. Yeah, confidence and confidence in His fatherly goodness is how we might summarize what they're describing in this answer. And then thirdly, I like this. I couldn't come up with a, another word, so I just had to quote it right out of the answer. Heavenly affections. Now, when they use the word affections, what do they mean? We might translate it as passions, um, desires, things of this nature. Uh, and by affections, by heavenly affections, what's the implication? This, these, are, these are healthy, godly desires that we have for our God. This is good. This is, as pointed out, this is the relationship that we enjoy with our Heavenly Father. Uh, Jeremiah the prophet uh, cries out in Lamentations chapter 3, let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. Uh, the idea is it's not just simply an outward form of, of praise, but also our hearts as well. Uh, this bringing this whole encompassing of the expression of an inward passion or desire or these heavenly affections. And then fourthly, we are to approach our Heavenly Father realizing these three things summarized in that last sentence. His sovereign power, His... What's after that? His majesty and... And is was it glorious? Yeah, gracious. His gracious condemn. I know I'm trying to remember how to spell it, Patty. Huh? You guys are no help. I knew there was a C in there. Condescension. Yeah. And if I have said at any point during this lecture, condensation doesn't belong. Ah, there we go. It's on your handout, right? I hope it is anyway. Um, realizing His sovereign power, majesty, and condensation. What are we acknowledging and acknowledging the sovereign power of God? Did I say condensation again? Uh, I was getting ready to say something tacky about uh, a rain dance, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it alone. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Are we talking about a rainstorm here? Thanks. Nobody else laughed but you. I appreciate it. All right. The showers of blessings. Yeah. Yeah, this is getting out of hand. Let's go back to sovereign power. Uh, what, 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 what are we? <laughs> uh, we approach our heavenly Father in prayer. What are we uh, acknowledging by realizing His sovereign power? We we come to God praying that He can do it. There's no question in our mind of God's ability, right? That He is in fact sovereign. He is able to do 
everything according to His will. He is able to do everything as He has revealed Himself and is in keeping with His character and His attributes. And so we come to Him praying, uh, realizing His sovereign power, and then secondly, His majesty. What does it mean to realize His majesty? I mean, and, and, and there's a certain tie in here with the reverence, isn't there? I mean, to, 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 to realize God's majesty is going to lead to my what? It's probably not going to lead to me referring to Jesus as my homeboy, right? It's probably going to refer to uh, a posture of, of, of reverence, a position of acknowledging His holiness, uh, and, and so forth and so on. And then thirdly, uh, His gracious condescension. Uh, what, what does it mean to realize His gracious condescension? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of... One reason why I love that expression is there's so much there that can lead us in prayer. I think about where my mind goes immediately is I think the revelation of God in His Word, His gracious condescension to reveal Himself. But of course, I also think about His incarnation, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, His perfect life, His atoning death, His victorious resurrection, all of that wrapped up in this idea of this gracious condescension. And so there's so much there that can lead us in Christian prayer and to pray it together. Uh, note here in this section, they point out the use of our. Right? Right? Were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great uh, uh, verse acknowledging uh, God's condescension uh, upon us. Uh, but what does this plural pronoun that's used in the prayer that Jesus gave us, what does our teach us? It's at the very end. I like this little add-on uh, at the end of question 189. What does the plural pronoun our teach us? What do they say? to pray with and for others. Um, is there a t any time within your Christian life in which you are divorced from the church of Christ? Is there any time where you are uh, apart from and not included in, as a Christian, in the body of Christ? There's not, is there? Now again, as I have said before, modern evangelicalism wants us to think that the Christian life is one of isolation and that it's one that's just about my personal relationship, as the phrase is used, with Jesus Christ. And it's led in modern evangelicalism to make deductions such as, well, going to church is negotiable. It's a, it's a recommendation as opposed to a command. If I just have enough Christian music on the radio, enough Chick-fil-A at the drive-thru, enough books at the bookstore, the Christian bookstore, I can live the Christian life. And that's just a myth. Uh, the reality is, is that you can't live the Christian life apart from the body of Christ because you are not apart from the body of Christ. And so it's integral that we see our prayer life united with praying together. And so this comes back to the, the topic of, of public prayer, but also remembering others in our prayers. One of the, the joys of, of being a pastor and also uh, being on the session of this church is to be able to get together with the elders of this church and to pray for the church to pray for you, and to consistently lift you up to our God in prayer. Uh, that's a real treat that I enjoy, and this is to be part of not just simply my prayer life, but your prayer life as well, as we pray with and for others. Well, that was just the preface. Let's move on to the, to the first petition here and see what uh, we're going to learn here. I'm at question 190. What do we pray for in this first petition? 
And the first petition, which is, Hallowed be thy name, acknowledging the utter inability and indisposition that is in ourselves and all men to honor God aright, we pray that God would, by His grace, enable us and incline us and others to know, acknowledge, and highly to esteem Him, His titles, attributes, ordinances, words, works, and whatsoever He is pleased to make Himself known by, and to glorify Him in thought, word, and deed, that He would prevent and remove atheism, ignorance, idolatry, profaneness, and whatsoever is dishonorable to Him, and by His overruling providence direct and dispose of all things to His own glory. <laughs> You'll never pray, hallowed be thy name again the same way, will you? Right? Well, let's dig into this. This is really rich theology. And let's, let's look first of all with making sure we understand the terminology that we use. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, what do we mean by hallowed? What does the word hallowed mean? Holy. Okay? Holy. The, the, the Greek word for holiness, hagiazo, means to dedicate, to make holy, or sanctify, or to revere as holy. And the way that it's used in this prayer, uh, in terms of the conjugation of that verb, it's used in third person singular, referring to God Himself. Singular in the third person. In, in other words, to, to, to uh, elaborate on that verse is to pr cry out, God, make yourself holy, for you are holy. Now that's a paraphrase, and I'm elaborating a little bit on that, which I'm going to show you the tie-in in just a second. But as that is translated in the third person singular, uh, errors, passive imperative, in case you wanted to know, we're taught and commanded and directed to pray to God in this way that He is to be regarded and treated as holy. And that's how our prayer starts. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. May You be regarded. May You be treated. Starting with Yours truly, as holy. You cannot get away from the setting of reverence in prayer if you have a right understanding of just that one word. There is no such thing as a flippant or casual right prayer if you understand what hallowed means. That God is to be regarded, that God is to be treated as holy. But then they elaborate on this, don't they? They elaborate on what it means that to, to, to say, Hallowed be thy name. They expand it and they add that God's name does not strictly mean His biblical names, does it? It's broader in scope. Look at some of the examples that they give here. His titles, His attributes, His ordinances, His word. His works. And then they add on, and whatsoever He is pleased to make Himself known by. Which gives me comfort that they could end a sentence in a preposition. And so now I can end a sentence in a preposition. The point that they're conveying here is that as we are praying to God and praying that He be regarded and treated as holy, we're not just talking about the English translated word God, or Lord, or Heavenly Father. It's oh so much more than that, isn't it? His titles? Okay, I've got that, John. That's an easy one. How about His attributes? Did that catch you by surprise? As God has revealed Himself in His attributes? 
about his ordinances, about his word and his works, etc., etc. The point is, is that we are to be broadly minded in our understanding of praying that God be glorified, that he be hallowed, and that name is broad in scope. What's our problem with praying this, though? What's the problem with you and I praying, hallowed be thy name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a con- comprehensive attribute. Yeah. Well, it, it is. I mean, I'm, I, the, the verse that I gave you in, in your outline, uh, but I could have given you a number of verses, uh, but I immediately think about Psalm 51, uh, where David is c- crying out, confessing his sin to God, and he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, what he's saying. I God is holy and I'm unholy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And who we are, and think about this, and the reason why I gave this verse is, is I could have given a myriad of verses about what a good job we do sinning. But note here that David is, if you'll allow me to elaborate on Psalm 51.5, he is saying, I'm not even worthy before I was even born. In my mother's womb, he says, in my mother's womb, I'm not worthy even in this sense, of, in this idea of, of, of holiness, right? And so we cannot, the problem is this, just put simply, and as they elaborate here in this answer, we just can't honor God the way that we should. We cannot honor God the way that we should. If we show up to pray to God thinking that it's something about us and something that that we've done, and that somehow, as I said jokingly a couple of weeks ago, that I'm showing up to prayer going, well, here I am, God, lucky you. I'm here to pray to you. That's just absolutely the opposite of what we're being taught in this prayer, isn't it? Hallowed be thy name. What is our need, and therefore, what should we pray? Well, if, if, if the need is, is that we're sinful and separated from Him, that He's God and that we're not, what should we be praying in response to our state? <laughs> Mercy. And I love the way that they describe it here. They, they say that we are to pray that God would enable us. I, I love these words. They, 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 they would... Did I get this anywhere? What is the first petition? Praying? It's somewhere around in here. Anyway, enable and incline. Oh, that helps me so much when I think about my prayer life. I'm praying not only that God by, by His Spirit will enable me to pray, but also, uh, and I've got a typo in your handout. It should be incline, not include. Uh, so you can tell that in my typing skills, I'm just as bad as I am on the whiteboard with condensation. <laughs> Uh, that should be inclined. That we pray that God would enable us. We also pray that God would incline us to know and appraise Him. Think about this going back a couple of weeks. Remember when we talked about that prayer is essentially an acknowledgement of our need? That no, no one comes to, to pray to God uh, in self sufficiency, in autonomy but rather we come to God as needy. In fact, the very posture of prayer is a posture of neediness. And then what we're saying here is even the ability to pray. Before we even get to the various petitions that we are to make, even the very ability to pray is by God's grace. Who's the one that enables us to pray? God. Who's the one that inclines us to pray? God, by virtue of the Holy Spirit, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. And not a boldness in our own. The only way we can approach the, our, our God in prayer and confidence is through whom? Christ, our mediator. And so just the very aspect of our prayer, we can even say this, is we, we use this, this phrase as gospel-centered a lot, um, but every single true Christian prayer is gospel-centered, isn't it? You cannot pray apart from Christ as our intercessor. We're praying through Him as our mediator. Yes. Yeah, that's good. All right, I've got to, to hurry up here. The latter part of this is how comprehensive should our prayer be? What, what part of, of, of ourselves are we praying for? We're praying for what? Our, our thought to be focused upon the holiness of God. Our words, the very words that we pray and the very deeds that we do. Did you notice how they laid that out there in that answer? The comprehensivity, thought, word, and deed. That pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? In all of this, as the, as the psalmist uh, sings, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And we could have added with the psalmist a number of other things as well, right? The point is the comprehensivity of our request to God. And what should we pray that God would prevent or remove? And I give a long list here, which you can come back and study uh, later, but I want to summarize it this way. What, what are they praying that God would prevent or that God would remove? Anything that dishonors God. If you look at that list of things that they give specifically uh, in that answer, all of those are dishonoring to God. All, are, all of those are an affront to who God is. I found it fascinating. They started with atheism. Uh, the, very, the very idea there is no God is an affront to God, right? And so anything from that to the other extreme, uh, we should pray that God would prevent or remove. Note that that's what we're praying for. It means that this is part of the human condition, right? We do have times where we cry out like the boy's father, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, that's, a, that's an acceptable prayer, but we're acknowledging that God is the one who helps us. God is the one who provides. And then finally, how does God hallow His own name? And how should this lead us in prayer? And I found this an interesting concept that they sort of land on, is that, that how should praying that God glorify Himself affect our prayers to Him. Well, ultimately, what we're praying is this. Ultimately, we're praying that God, by His providence, would direct and dispose all things for His glory. Even in those things that we don't know what to pray we should at least acknowledge that we can pray that God would direct and dispose all things for His glory. Our chief end, right? Well, uh, we're out of time, and so we'll conclude there. Uh, next week we'll pick up uh, starting in question 191, and, and Lord willing, get to 192 as well. Let me pray for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, You are our Father by Your grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. A true and lasting and eternal relationship originated and accomplished by You. And so we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for Your work within us. We thank You for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You for the Holy Spirit's work in awakening us, regenerating our hearts. And we thank You for the high privilege and honor of praying to You, 
which even that we are unworthy to do, but come boldly to your throne through our perfect and righteous mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this. We pray that you would forgive us for the times in which we have come to you irreverently. Forgive us for the times in which we have come to you with self-seeking ambitions. Forgive us when we have not honored you and glorified you and prayed that you would glorify yourself in our prayers. And so we pray that you would forgive us and encourage us, enable us and incline us to glorify you through prayer. Lord, we pray now that you would prepare our hearts to worship you. We pray that as we go across the street, that it would not simply be a, a time of, uh, of uh, requirement or a time of uh, checking another box in our Christian life, that we would go across with these holy affections, these righteous affections, seeking to worship You. We pray that You would work by Your Spirit, through the singing of Your Word, and through the preaching of Your Word, and through the reading of Your Word, and through the fellowship of Your people. We pray that You would be glorified today in our worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.